An exile without dignity is what I seem to be. And once I figured my fear that I was hunted was not the cause that made me cower in some anonymous city tower, but really the shadow of my need to reconnect with that passion flow that was the Atlantean creed. And so, when I was invited to return, and once more add my labour to the many, I complied with alacrity, for of a future I had not any. Back to the rain-swept, wind-lashed, tumbling sea, and so once more on Innisfree I tasted the flavour of Atlantis life, and for a brief while upheld my smile, and tried to slip into the shifting scenes, the ever-changing alliances, the vital regular routines. But their arms weren't quite as welcome as I wanted them to be, and gradually I drifted back into a familiar purgatory of depressive thought, and too distant to ask for help, I silently withdrew, and through reaction-response Atlantis karma, I fell out of role as an actor in the daily drama, and thus lost in my way, in that state of discomfort I could no longer bear to stay. So I crept out one early morning, determined with those feelings to flee. To my companions I offered no warning, but sneaked down to the jetty to clamber aboard a dinghy that would ferry me away from the bleak isle of Innisfree. I rode through tide and current, and I rode that dire strait feverishly, until, once more, upon the mainland, I felt free. And later, she said, if only he could put that much energy into the community. But my freedom illusion was soon to drown, as I saw myself a simpering clown, belittled, unvalued, unloosed, with a begrudging guilt a sense of humiliation, for once I had trusted that Atlantis life to be my path, my destiny station, and so adrift once more in streets and bars and toxic traffic, I eventually determined to yet again return, though to a different lighthouse where the light of Atlantis did burn, moored in the heart of an English estuary, an ocean-going craft seeking repair. And for a while, with that Atlantean crew, I squatted there, learning the ways of the vessel that they hoped one day would take them all to South America. And so I stepped back into the Atlantean flow, until, after a while, it was pointed out something I really should know. I wasn't fitting in. My energy was oh so low and as their reactions to me gained power, I opted for the cut-off, mouldering, smouldering scour, shifting towards another strategy. Feel sorry for me, have pity, surely some care and attention to soothe my sad condition, which brought down in inevitable Atlantean style, their fierce deflective mockery. Was I, little Lord Lavatory, shitting sad poems for posterity, scolds and stunts at my expense, by those who now stood where so often had stood I, with my Mickey taking mantras and my wicked little jibes? Until finally the mistress of that vessel took me onto the land, and smiled upon my sulky being, held me tenderly by the hand. She who had regarded me so disparagingly, was I now her favoured man? That cheque that you promised us, a small trust my father had prepared for me, it's time you passed it over, you owe us, we've changed your world, don't you see? And I, in the soothe of her acceptance, went with her to the bank, and added my signature to what before I had wisely kept blank. But once the deed was done, well, she had no further cause to indulge me and smile with tenderness, and she brought back out her claws, and then I saw that her approval I had failed to procure. I grew cold and bitter and grey, and sneaking back to that bank, I begged, cancel, cancel, now, today! 
but my cash had surely flown, and thus my resources did not extend beyond a pitiful moan. So now my time was really done. Outraged and verging on despair, I bade my final farewell to Atlantis and all they had to share. How could I be their chosen child? I was not exciting or wild. I was a creature of comfortable culture. My passions were small and held in. I lived in fear of Protestant sin. My limits were not something I dared to break. I could not live with everything at stake. And I recalled why first I had came to that alarming place, driven by my pool of life ache, persuaded by Janoff's primal scream, that I was not a loser, not a waster, not a lost soul sliding down the drain. Instead, I had neurosis. I was a victim of primal pain, and my love for fanciful notions had convinced me to believe these wild Arcadian primal therapists would bring me back to ease, would kindly show me ways to cure this neurosis disease, then I would go swaggering across the land with freedom at my knees. And yet, in truth, I did have to see. Mine was now a modified ideology. They had changed my worldview to a noticeable degree. But still, I opted for the skin-deep life, to reduce the risk, to minimise the strife of reaching those deeper, larger parts of me, so much more powerful and vibrant, oh, and with such a louder voice. Yes, I opted for my smaller self, though at the time I felt I had no choice. So I cannot say that I regret my efforts at participation in that place of intimate connection and reorientation, nor the brief excursions that I took into my inner space, not even all the times I shamefully lost face, not, nor the letters to my mother describing my disgrace. Oh, but this I do lament, that after all that time I spent, I could have emerged in better grace.'